Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the ninth of the eighth month, which is also the 22nd of October of 2022 on the Gregorian calendar. And we're going to continue now with our reading of Bereshit or Genesis, but we're going to start back in chapter one. However, as a little recap here, before we get into Genesis or Bereshit itself, I wanted to go over the first day of creation in the book of Yobelin from chapter two. And in that, you'll see a parable of everything that our Mashiach is going to be doing during that first period of history, the, the antediluvian period, if you will, from the, the time of Adam to Hanok, the seventh from Adam, right? <clears throat> but in reality, Mo, uh, Noah was also alive during that time. So it, it was that generation that was pre-flood and what was happening, the works of our Mashiach, right? So here we go. This is from Yobelim or Jubilees chapter two. It's subtitled Moshe is given the complete history from creation. And that's what the Melech or the messenger of the presence who our Mashiach was speaking to Moshe here. And you find that out through the course of the writing. He's the one that appeared to, you know, to Abraham to stop him from slaying Yitzhak. He's the one that the word was sent to individuals through him and the, the the way he speaks is with authority you can see the themes in there but it's fully made known in the recognitions of clement in Irenaeus and things like that where they freely tell you that it was always our mashiach as the mediator between elohim the father and men it wasn't the only time messengers or he's not the only messenger that was ever sent to men but that's why it, it, I believe Kepha mentions that in, uh, what was it? In um, the recognitions of Clement, when he was speaking on an intelligent man, if he's, if he's intelligent, he'll ask, they'll inquire who it is that speaks to them. So they'll both know the dignity of the one present and the one who sent him, right? And then you can see that throughout the writings. Manoach, uh, Samson or Shem, Shemsun, right, his father, he asks the name of the messenger. And he says, why do you ask my name? For it is paleo or wonderful. And then the, the Masoretic text moves on from there. But the Dead Sea Scrolls reveals that he, re, he makes his name known to him. And then tells him some other stuff, which is pretty interesting. I don't know it all off the top of my head. But... Um, Abraham, I believe, asks the name. Jacob asks the one who's speaking to him. Moshe asks the one who's speaking, who, who do I say sent me, right? And then he's directly told. And he's told, Ehiye Asher Ehiye, or Ahia Asher Ahia, right? Which is who the one in the linen robe with the golden band across it from the book of Gad the seer said that he was the Ahie Asher Ahie. And that is the same picture of the figure of our Mashiach you read about in Revelation and all throughout the common scriptures. So there, there's all these connections that you can start seeing the, the patterns there and who's speaking to these people. But whenever it's dealing with his children, it was our Mashiach. And then you can find in the shepherd of Hermas when the people are righteous when they're not, when they're walking Tamim or perfectly before our maker, they have Mikael, like who is like El, the messenger, the chief messenger over them. When they start to go wayward, our, the shepherd of the messenger of repentance takes them in and has special attention over them. They're all his though, but the pattern there, like those that are the fathers are given to his who is like you of all creatures made on earth, right? Speaking of our Mashiach. So his chosen get given to his chief messenger. It's the, the hand within the glove picture again. And of willing, the more we go through this, you're going to see that over and over again. <clears throat> but to continue, it says, 
And the Melech of the Presence, or the Messenger of the Presence, spoke to Moshe, according to the word of Yahuwah, saying, Write the complete history of the creation. How in six Yamim, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day, right? Yahuwah Shaddai, or Almighty, finished all his works and all that he created. And he kept Shabbat on the seventh Yom and Kadosh it or set it apart for all ages and appointed it as a sign or oath, right, for all his works. For, and this is the part that we're going to read here, right? For on the first day or Yom, he created Aleph, the Shemaim, which are above. That's the highest Shemaim, right? The firmament which is below it was created on the second day. It says, and Bet, or the earth, and Gimel, the waters, and Dalit, all the Ruachoth, or spirits, which serve before him, the messengers of the presence, and the messengers of set apartness, and the messengers of the Ruach of fire, and the messenger of the Ruach of the winds, plural. And you find out about the winds in the book of Hanok in detail, right? And the messenger or Melakim of the Ruach of the clouds, and of darkness, and of snow, and of hail, and of hoarfrost, and the Melakim or messengers of the voices, and the Melakim, or uh, and of the thunder, I'm sorry. And this right here is an amazing parallel. I just now realized that to what you find throughout Revelation and literal history, where, and this uses the Greek, there might be a parallel in the Hebrew. I'm not as familiar with that. But in the word for the Greek for voices, it's the same word for thundering or a sound, right? Phonic or phonos or something like that. But that same phenomenon that was foretold with soundings or thunders or voices are what literally happened where people are hearing those three phenomena, either something like a trumpet or something like a hum or different noises, literally in, in the sky. So that I was just telling my second eldest son the other day the the things that we see around us we overlook these things like magnetism the waves of the ocean all these things the wind these are messengers they're spiritual beings things that are not seen that affect reality but they're they're living and they were created right here along with as you'll see this the inner beings of men <clears throat> this is in the messenger of the voices and the and the thunder and of the lightning and the messengers of the Ruach Oath of cold and of heat and of winter and of spring and of autumn and of summer and of all the Ruach Oath or inner beings of his creatures which are in the Shemaim and on the earth. And this is why it mentions in the recognitions of Clement by Kepha that the internal species of man is older than his body. And this is why it says right here at, in verse 3, and then also in the book of Job, that the sons of Elohim sang or rejoiced in him on this first yom. You can't be inconsistent with the truth. So that means that everyone that was ever going to be his, that he created, praised him at that time. But it says, hey is the abysses, Wa, the darkness, and Zion, the light, day, evening, and dawn, which he has prepared in the knowledge of his heart. And that's actually quoted in one of the apocryphal psalms or one of the, uh, one of the psalms that you can find from the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> And it says, and thereupon we saw his works and praised him and lauded before him on account of all his works. For seven great works he did, or did he create on the first day. 
Now that whole pattern for what was created and what all these things mean, we it could take a it could take you know many times to go over all of that. But I encourage you all when you have time, just do a word search for scripture. Type in spirits, if you will, or messengers, or or snow, or hell, or horror frost, or any one of these words. And then go through and read every part that's mentioned in context, and you're going to get a sense of what he, the truth, has to say about that subject. All right. <clears throat> so, excuse me. And I, I'm sorry, this was originally written, I shared this a while ago, when I was still, let me see. I was still learning about the language, and I still am. This was 2016 that I made this post. So I had a little bit of spelling variance right here, like Alahim. At the time, I didn't recognize vowel points whatsoever as legitimate because it was added afterward. So I was still trying to learn the language, and I was not realizing that there was a wa originally. You have Aleph, Lamed, Wa, He, Yod, Mem. So Elohim is literally how it's pronounced. But <clears throat> long story short, some of these spellings are going to be a little off. I apologize. That's that's why that is. However, this is Bereshit chapter one. Okay. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created et, the Aleph Tau, which our Mashiach says in Revelation, I am the Aleph and the Tau, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Right. So he says, in the beginning, Elohim created Eth, the Shemaim, Wa Eth, and Eth, the earth, right? Or land. And the land came to be formless and empty, and darkness was on the face of the deep. It Kepha makes it clear that this is because the mundane bodies created with the land and the Shemaim and the waters cause darkness to be on the deep or the abysses, not everywhere. But that was because the, the, the Father dwells in unapproachable light, and he's not changeable. He's forever consistent with himself. So there was always light, and then the, the mundane bodies of creation caused darkness. And all of this is foretelling what would happen in the future, okay? There's always truth and light reigning. There was always knowledge of what is. But because of creation, the mundane bodies of the, which they go over the philosophy of that in other places, I don't want to get too deep. But because of men, darkness came to be because of creation, right? And the Ruach of Elohim was moving on the face of the waters. And Elohim said, let light come to be, or literally, Yahi or, and light came to be. But this says, Yahi or, wa, Yahi or. Literally, what he said is what exactly what is. And Elohim saw at the light that it was good. And Elohim separated the light from the darkness. And Elohim called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning, the first day, or Yom Achad. And Elohim said, let an expanse or firmament come to be in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the expanse or firmament, and separated the waters which were under the firmament, from the waters which were above the firmament, and it came to be so. And Elohim called the expanse Shemaim, or there, I'm sorry, in the Septuagint, it would have said, and Elohim saw that it was good. All right? He called the expanse firmament, or Shemaim, and he saw that it was good, and it came to be evening, and there came to be morning the second day. I don't know why it was missing from the Masoretic text, but you do see it in other places where every day of the week he called good, right? 
not every creature he called good or not every creature he gave a baraka to but every day and all the things that he made he called good and at the end he calls it tov meo or very good right and it says and elohim said let the waters under the shamayim be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it came to be so and elohim called the dry land earth or arets right and the collection of the waters he called seas and elohim saw that it was good and elohim said let the earth bring forth grass the plant that yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself on the earth and it came to be so and the earth brought forth grass the plant that yields seed according to its kind and the seed that yields or in the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind now you can see of all creation of all plant life there is there's three kinds so all these other subspecies and categories and things that they do and they do the same thing with animal life which is a lot more perverted because they, they try to tie men in with 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 whales and things like that because there's similarities it's all evolutionary nonsense but right here you can see this is established reality okay that's why when people say well mushrooms are a fungus but they're they're a plant that bears seed in itself there is no distinction there otherwise right i i haven't found one I don't particularly care for mushrooms myself, but everyone has their own tastes and there is nothing in here that says you can't. Although just like there's some fruits that are poisonous, there's some mushrooms that are poisonous, there's some trees that are not good to be around, right? Um, these are all things because of sin and to teach man. If we'll get to it in a minute, but you'll see in the next chapter that everything he made, all creation were messengers. Literally, he made messages in everything to teach man knowledge it says an elohim saw that it was tov and there came to be evening and there came to be morning the third day and elohim said let lights come to be in the firmament of the shamayim to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and appointed times and for days and for years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the shamayim to give light on the earth and these are the things that were placed high and exalted that all men perceive but not all comprehend right it mentions in a variety of places that the stars know him by name they're they're all called by name they know him who names them they show forth him who numbers them and the stars represent the children of light right the, the moon is the malkuth the kingdom and then the sun is our like our mashiach the bridegroom and, and that was what was fully established in the fourth day this one is very easy to see the parables are all throughout the accounts that he walked so yeah that's why i'm pointing that out now every day of creation functions that way So it says, <clears throat> and Elohim made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And Elohim set them in the firmament of the Shemaim to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And Elohim saw that it was tov or good and there came to be evening and there came to be morning the fourth day and elohim said let the waters teem with shoals of living creatures and let birds of or, i'm sorry and let birds fly above the earth on the face of the firmament right expanse of the shamayim and elohim created great sea monsters or creatures and every living creature that moves 
with which the waters teemed, according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was tov, or good. And Elohim baruch them, saying, Bear fruit and increase, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning, the fifth day. And Elohim said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, livestock and creeping creatures. This word for livestock is literally the one for living creatures. And we'll see in chapter 2 also, it's the first mention of the letter chet. Like, they don't say that chet yod tau is a word. If you look it up, it, it is, is not a word that they, they say that. But it's actually used in scripture in chapter 2 and at the flood for the living creatures that went into the ark that were preserved. And that word is literally chai and with a tau at the end, right? Chai or chaim is life. But it says, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to its kind. That would be that one, right? Livestock and creeping creatures and beasts of the earth according to its kind. And these are the three distinctions of animal life on, on the land, right? Livestock or cattle, creeping creatures and beasts of the earth according to its kind. And it came to be so. And Elohim made the beast of the earth according to its kind, livestock according to its kind, and all that creep on the earth according to its kind. And Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the Shemaim, and over the livestock, and over all the earth and over all the creeping creatures that creep on the earth. And this is where our creator gave men, man, dominion and authority over everything in creation. This is where in our country, it's established that the people are sovereign. Elohim is king, right, over all of us, and we're all equal. We're all kings of our own castle, if you will, because he gave us dominion here. And it says, and, oh, and one more thing. It says, let us make man in our image. There's a lot of people that have different opinions about this. And if you, I highly encourage everyone to read the recognitions of Clement, because it's like the book of Acts for Kepha that was recorded by a taught one of his, Clement of Rome, who became the overseer or after or contemporary with the death of Kepha. And then he was overseer for at least 30 years until he was a martyr during the reign of his cousin Domitian in the 90s. Around the same time when Yahukanon was banished to Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation. <clears throat> but anyways, Simon the Magician, in there he makes mention that this is a verse and there's many others that speak of multiple mighty ones. And he uses it as a thing promoting polytheism. But Kepha there, Arrhenius and others make it very clear that there is only one true Elohim, the Father. And then there are those who are called Elohim because they represent him. And that would be our Mashiach. And our Mashiach showed that pattern in what he did with Moshe. Because as he sees and, and as he hears, so he does. Like the hand in the glove, hand in the glove thing. So this was the father speaking to his son through whom he was pleased to make all things, which is what it mentions in the epistles. And this is a thing that I want you to take. If you're familiar with the renewed covenant writings, then as we go through this, everything our Mashiach said was true. You can see him all throughout here in everything that he does, everything that he said, he was just making known what actually is in creation. Right. It says, and Elohim created man in his image, not his likeness right away, right? 
because that is the last work he did in creation in the parable of creation, which is the work that he's accomplishing before his return. That's something you can see. You read about it. Yobelim chapter one. You can see it in Deuteronomy. You can see it at the death of Abraham. We would go apostate. We would be perverted. We would have to learn from our mistakes, repent, and come back to him with all our heart and not turn from him anymore. So it was foretold from the beginning. But it says, he made him in his image. In the image of Elohim, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And Elohim baruch them. And Elohim said to them, bear fruit and increase. Like peru oravu, right? And fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea. And over the birds of the shamayim. And over all creatures moving on the earth. And Elohim said, See, I have given you every plant that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it is for food. And that's the instruction. We are not to add to or take away. Okay. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the Shemayim, and to every creeping creature on the earth in which there is life, every green plant is for food, and it came to be so. And Elohim saw all that he had made, and see, it was very good. This is that Tov Meod right here. And there came to be evening, and there came to be morning the sixth day and this is why it says in sirach that all that yahuwah has made is good and everything is right in its season including the punishments and judgments he made which were alluded to in the thunders and the lightnings and the different messengers up above there all right so that was the end of the sixth day if you give me just a moment we'll switch over and i want to show you something real quick all right so shalom everyone all Sorry. Right, no problem brother all right i fell um, asleep in the chair it, it's not a problem all right sorry about that so real quick this is from the brenton's septuagint translation i just wanted to show everyone so you didn't have to just take my word for it this is the second yom, verse 6, and you can see that, or the second yom of creation. You can see here in verse <clears throat> 8, specifically, and Elohim called the firmament Shemaim, and Elohim saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. So every day of the week he called good, and then at the end of the sixth day, he called it very good. Let me find that. There we go. They were tov meod, as he said. And all of this has to do with his works that he's doing during the day that are represented in parable form right here in creation, which is why you can read in the foretellers in the Psalms that he he speaks in parables, right? He mentions that when he was there, he he only talks to the people in parables, and there's nothing that he did not say to them in parables, but to his taught ones, he reveals what they mean. Right? Plain, plain, simple truth right there. All right. So just one moment, and then I'll switch over to the rest of their sheet that we were reading. All right, I'm sorry about that. Welcome back. We had to hop back into bear sheet real quick, and this is on chapter two. So we'll be going between the regular text here and then an interlinear to look at the differences and to look at the nuances in the Hebrew that we might not see in the English, okay? I'm not going to do that exhaustively for every bit because we'd be we'd be here for quite a while, but just a few things to help us comprehend the events that are going on. Now, it, the Aleph, the first thing he created was the highest Shemaim, and the Aleph is like a, a concept, the plan, 
or the intent. It, as a prefix, it means I will or I am. And it's literally has to do with those who will teach and learn with their mouth to bring forth thousands yoked together, domesticated and trained, like what the voice of Yahuwah or Mashiach did in the garden, teaching man to guard and till it, which we're going to get to. But because he taught men and he led thousands to righteousness with his mouth, he was at the right hand of the Father in the Shamayim before the messengers. And that very pattern is given to people who do that very same thing. A second witness to that, because it's in what it's inherent in the letter, Aleph, in the creation work and in the story of what he did and the reality of what is with that, right? Our Mashiach was the voice of Yahuwah in the garden, teaching man as the first work, and he is at the right hand of the Father. You can see a second witness in the book of Hanok, where he was made, and this is the seventh work there with light. One of those is knowledge, light. Hanok was revealed all things. He was shown all creation. He was made like a messenger and brought before the Almighty, who he could not perceive or look upon. His garments were brighter than the sun, and no messenger can see him, right? But he was turned into like a messenger to be brought into his presence, and he didn't die because he was not in flesh to, to do that. And while he was there, he mentions very plainly that his habitation, his reward, would be in the Shemaim, like the messengers before the presence of the Father forever. And he said he longs for that, but it's not for him yet. And then he was escorted into the Garden of Eden. A another witness, but there's a little different to that. Those that are dedicated eunuchs for the reign, right? Not, not everyone. Everyone that's like an overseer. Those that shine like the brightness of the, the stars, it mentions in Daniel, right? And like the firmament. They're all going to be the ones like Louis, those that draw unto him and teach men the truth. They're like the messengers of, of his presence. This is mentioned in the Testament of Louis and the common scriptures. It's the picture of teachers and overseers and their reward for being true to the truth and staying trustworthy. In the same way, virgins are guaranteed a place in the Shemaim. The poor are guaranteed a place in the kingdom. So are those that suffer for righteousness sake. These are absolute guarantees that are in scripture. All of those things are things that if you, if you believe it and it's happening, then you can rest assured that you're his and you can have joy in your heart. Right? Just like it mentions in the apostolic constitutions. And back on track. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Bear sheet chapter two says, Thus the Shemaim and the earth, it would have been Eth the Shemaim and Eth the earth, were completed in all their array. And in the seventh day, Elohim completed his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And Elohim Baruch the seventh day and set it apart. Because on it, he rested from all his work, which Elohim in creating had made. These are the births of the Shemaim and the earth when they were created. In the day that Yahuwah Elohim made the earth and Shemaim. I'm sorry, I had a typo there. But our Mashiach, when he was in the flesh, he says, I labor, or my father labors until now, and I labor. And this is what he was talking about. They're laboring until his rest on the millennial reign. Now, this is literally true. And it's also a foreshadow and a, a, a parable of what was, what was happening in reality. Okay. And no shrub of the earth. And we'll look at this in the Hebrew in just a moment. Because this is the English is telling you what it means. But it's not literal of what it actually says. So it says, now no shrub of the field was yet on the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For Yahuwah Elohim had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the entire surface of the ground. 
and that would be like the dew. All right. And Yahuwah, Elohim, formed Adam, or man, out of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. And the man became a living being, or a living soul, as they like to translate that. All right, so just real quick, I wanted to show you right here. So the word for his works, one thing that I wanted to show you is like everything is a parable and these are all messages. He's trying to teach man knowledge, it says, and he's made all things in his wisdom or hokma, and it's by his comprehension that he's brought them about. This is throughout the Proverbs, Proverb 8 in particular, the wisdom or hokma of Shalomo, the book of Job. But right here in the Hebrew, you can see that his work is the this is malacto right malacto but right here melek that's the word for a messenger and that's actually the the root the root word of this one you can see right here his the wa as a suffix means his a tau as a suffix or a prefix can put it as a past tense thing or a future tense thing but this is something that he's just done, and then it belongs to him. So that, that's why you have the Tao Wa. When you look at this real quick, <clears throat> this is literally an occupation or work, and you can go through these and see what they're translated as throughout different scripture version, right? But his craftsmanship is a melek, which is a messenger or an envoy, and an envoy has something to tell, an ambassador to the truth. And that's how you can look at all of creation. It's trying to teach men knowledge, trying to teach us the truth if we'll only look at what is and compare it to what's written. All right, so well, one more thing real quick. Right here, you can see that the he kadosh it, right? He kadosh aleph tau. They call that it. But right there on the um, fourth commandment, when you look at the Hebrew, it says, oh, what is it? I'm just going to go there and read it to you personally. Just give me one moment. So it says you here we go. Remember the Shabbat Yom La Kadoshu, or La Kadoshu is literally to set him apart, but they translate it as it. There is no gender neutral it word in Hebrew. It's always a, a it's gendered. So it's a him, unless it's a feminine thing in which it's a her. Many languages function in that way. English has gender neutral but never existed in the language here. So literally, and he set him apart, and that's Aleph Tau, him, for in it, or in him, Shabbat, Makol, his work, right? Or making his messengers. And this is why he, has, he mentions that he has innumerable messengers throughout the scriptures, right? Just another thing to keep in mind. <clears throat> Then uh, one more thing real quick with the word for living being or nefesh, I want to go the breath of life and what that meant. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then, like I said, we could be going over this in detail eventually when, when you start learning the Hebrew more, I really want to get into it because then you'll see, you'll see some amazing detail, but right now we're, we're just going to go into a few words and you can see some things that I want to point out here. So he breathed into him the breath. This is nasha. This is nish math, right? Nish math, which is breath, but literally um, life, person's alive, spirit who breathes, right? This is related to nefesh, but it's not. 
the same word. This is only used when he breathes into man right here. And then this is probably the exact same word without deviation when our Mashiach breathed on his taught ones after he was risen from the dead. And remember, he said, my words that I speak are Ruach and life, right? So he breathed onto them, Chaim, and Yehi, he became Ha'adam, La Nefesh, Chaya. That's a Chaya. They say Heya right there, but the here, that dot right here is where they get the Chaith and they make it a guttural. It was common in antiquity that these things would soften, and that's why you have like the Hevel is Abel, the uh, Hamor is Habor, and you have the H sound instead of the Chaith. But right here, Elohim breathed into him and he became Nefesh. That's the, that's the inner being of a man that was made from the beginning on day one. Sorry. All right. Now, the, there's a distinction here because the nefesh is not the ruach. The ruach, the ruach, if you want to pronounce it right, it's a pathak. So it's ruach, right? But the ruach is the spirit, if you will, and that is from the father or from the adversary. You have two ruach oath that rule over men. And you're either going to have the influences of the one or the other predominant in your life. And it's whichever one you give it, yield yourself to obedience, as is explained in the epistles, right? But moving on, it says, And Yahuwah, Elohim, planted a garden in Eden to the east. And there he put the man, or the Adam, whom he had formed. And out of the ground, Yahuwah Elohim made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And, or sorry, with the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided the, and became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one surrounding the entire land of Chavila or Chawila. And there's a there's a YouTube channel that put out a video. I can't recommend most of what they make, but one of them they talk about how they believe that the Philippines was Havila or more particularly Ophir from scripture. And while I don't necessarily agree that it might be Chawila here, because it depends on the, the circumstances we're going to look at, but it might not be this place, but Ophir as the Isles of Gold from the Philippines is definitely something that was legitimate. So I highly recommend um, that, which I'll link in the, in the description with the video, and I'll share with you guys all later. But I really don't recommend any of the other writings they have or any of the other stuff they have, um, because it, it's not sticking solely with what is written. So um, I don't mean to be rude or talk down about anyone. My whole point is we want to stick to what's true. We don't want to add to, we don't want to take away. We don't want to be mixing things up and or just making it up. This is, and this is where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedelium is there and Shoham stone, or sorry, and the Shoham stone. And the name of the second river is Gihon. They say Gihon, right? But Gihon, Gihon, it is the one surrounding the entire land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Chedikel, Chedikel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Now, this one right here is actually, they say Euphrates, and you can generally know that that's accurate because it's right there in the, 
interlinear. You can see it in the, the language itself. I'll show you real quick. I didn't look at the other ones, but they're generally spelled that way. Um, the last one is not, Euphrates is not the actual word, but you can see it right here. That is the pay, resh, tau. So that would be theraith, theraiths, tha, rat. And then you have the u and the the es, the s. This is the t's would be a Greek suffix. And then I don't know where that came from, but this is the same word. That's quite often that languages shift that way. You can find this throughout history, even in the English from the Hebrew. You see many examples of how things can change a little bit, but still have the root in it. And you can find that pretty easy. Another way you can see this kind of phenomenon in scripture is with the writing on the wall from the book of Daniel. Mini, mini, tikel, parson, or me, Mick Parson, or I'm. McPherson, I'm not saying exactly right, but those were abbreviations for the Medes and Persians were going to divide and conquer because he's been found, uh, he's been weighed and found wanting, right? The point is, if this is the Euphrates, like the word suggests that that actually is, and it's known today, then this area cannot be outside of the Middle East. And there's a lot of evidence that the land of Eden was over by Armenia. I don't have all the answers. I really, I really don't. It directly mentions in the book of Hanok that the garden of righteousness is in the center of the earth, along with the, <clears throat> there's also four in lane rivers, and you can find this in, in confirmed in history too the Mercator's map and some others talk about it. I don't really want to get into that, but the point is there might be another place that's known as Eden and this one, or it could have been that that was moved because the tree of life was taken out and it's going to be returned. Um, he can do what he wants with his own creation. What I do know as a fact is that Eden exists and there are men that are currently dwelling there that are pleasing to our creator that never saw death. And it mentions also that our Mashiach dwells with them there. He might not be there continually, but he does go there. Irenaeus also mentions with the threefold reward, the hundredfold reward will be in the Shemaim. The sixtyfold reward will be in New Yarushalayim. And the thirtyfold reward will be in the garden. But everywhere our Mashiach will be present because he'll be going around throughout his creation. It says, and Yahuwah Elohim took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to guard it. And Yahuwah Elohim commanded the man, saying, eat of every tree of the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall certainly die. And here's in the first allusion to a day being like a thousand years. Now, you ask where Eden is today, that's the, the thing. I don't have all the answers for that. I don't know if it was literally moved. I do know that there's evidence right here that Eden was in the Middle East. It was the portion of Shem that was the, the pleasant land, it mentions in the book of Yobelim. The, the portion of Eden went to him, and it was also... Um, the pleasant land was also Yarushalayim, specifically the land of Yisrael, because it would be the place where he's attendant to all the time and he came and walked. That was where he came to dwell and where the great sovereign rules, as our Mashiach said. But um, I don't know where it, they had, uh, the land of Eden was mentioned in antiquity around Armenia. The Valley of Eden, or the the oh, it's mentioned in the scriptures too. I'll have to find it again, but I don't directly know where it could have been there. 
However, it mentions in the book of Hanok that the garden of righteousness is in the center of the earth, where you have the firmament over the top, and it's generally planar. It's not flat because you have contours, you have valleys, you have mountains, you have different topographical features. But water is level, the, gen the, the sea level, and then land is above it. So it's generally what you call the flat earth description or model with a dome. And then right in the center of it is where they say the Garden of Righteousness is, to the east in Eden specifically and if you look at those the, the map from Mercator, there's there's four islands with four inflowing rivers right there in the center of the earth the magnetic mountain what they call mount miru it's a 33 mile wide circumference magnetic mountain what all the compasses in the world point to and it has a 480 mile wide inflowing um, vortex the waters, the, the rivers go in and the water goes down. And it's a giant, it's a giant filtration system for the earth. Um, it's not that important at the moment, but that's where it says Eden is. That's also where the throne of Elohim will come down and he'll he'll dwell. There's a mountain built like a throne for him. So there's interesting things that you can look at there. And one thing you have to keep in mind, anytime we have one witness to something that is not established fact you can't say well that's the only truth we have we can say it's the only truth we have we can use that but if you don't have two or more witnesses to confirm something you can't you can't be dogmatic because he he established that as his law so when you're looking at the books like the book of hanok or the testaments of the 12 patriarchs or even the common scriptures you're going to find some things that might be a little off sometimes there's sections missing and the best thing that you can see it in is like hanok or i'll give you an example real quick the testament of louis <clears throat> we pointed this out when we were going over the prayers video if you remember but it mentions in the greek version the translation that we have carried down that, that's common it mentions that he prayed and then, then he had a vision. In the Dead Sea Scrolls version of his testament, it mentions that he prayed, but it says that he first changed his garments and cleaned them. He washed his hands and he lifted them. And, and then he actually has the prayer being spoken. And he says all these different things. And the very things that he says happens to him. That phenomenon you keep seeing, just like, our Mashiach said, ask and it'll be given, seek and you'll find, not going to be open to you. That very thing happens. The prayers are answered, even for people who aren't walking right, as you'll see in just a moment. But we'll go ahead and continue. And Yahuwah Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So it's not tov to be bad, is literally what it said. I'm going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. And we'll find out in the book of Yobelim. It This is not, this doesn't give you the timeline for exact times when things were happening. But all creation happened the first week he made Adam and then he rested on the Shabbat. In the book of Yobelim, you see that next week for the first five days or the you know, for the six days that are there, Yahuwah, our Mashiach, the father through our Mishyach brings all the creatures to Adam and Adam sees them and then names them. And then what he names them is what they're called. After that, he sees that there was no help me for him or no, excuse me, no partner like he saw with all those others. And then he said, it's not good. It's not tov for man to be bad or alone. He says, I'm going to make, and that was at the end of the sixth day of the second week, right? And all of that is established. You'll find it in Yobelim. We'll read that eventually when we get to it. But um, in there, you find that because of how he established things in creation right here at the beginning, man created the sixth day, brought into the garden on the 40th after his creation. So 
a week and then 33 days, right? And for the woman, it was double. And because of how it was established in creation there was everyone that was a partaker of the truth of the eternal covenant in relationship with our maker who is the truth, right? They reflected that in their lives. Whenever a woman had a male child separated for a week and then 33 days and then brought in and for a, a daughter, it was double. So everyone that's a partaker of the truth starts to walk these things out. And that's true for everything that he established, the, the, all the laws that are applicable. We don't do sacrifices anymore, but these things still apply, right? Um, all of the established pattern for the, the Torah, for the festivals, and you can see that again in detail in the book of Yobelim, but all the righteous are the ones that reflect the truth and walk it out. He says, follow me, right? <clears throat> and from the ground, Yahuwah Elohim formed every beast of the field and every bird of the Shemaim and brought them to the man or to the Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living being, that was its name. So the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the Shemaim and to every beast of the field. Yet for the man, there was not found a helper for him as his counterpart. I don't want to cut in too much anymore, but I do want to point something out. He paraphrases what he did right here, how he created man and woman, and then he goes into detail. People, people have a lot of different ideas for why this is done and whatnot. But you remember, it says in Amos that he does no thing without first revealing it to his servants, the foretellers. So he makes a matter known and then does it. And you can see this alluded to all throughout creation where you'll get a taste of the things to come and then it'll happen. Like when the children were disobedient, they were persecuted by their enemies, had them plundered, they came in and conquered, but they weren't completely uprooted out of the land until after. It was like a type of it, right? You can see that kind of thing happening again and again throughout scripture as well. This is yet for the man, there was not found a helper for him as his counterpart. <clears throat> so Yahuwah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib, which Yahuwah Elohim had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. All right, so right here real quick, I wanted to show you the rib. A lot of people, they have issues about what this word means, right? But ha, that's the hey, means the, it's the definite article, right? And then zela, zela, right? Has zela, has zela. This is a dot that they call the do a dogish forte, or it's a doubling dogish. Whenever you see a dot like that, it doubles that consonant. And this is what, in the English language, we double the middle ling word in, as a par for the course middle, puddle, muddle, dr um, dipping, slipping, uh, piping, right? Middle, I think I already said that one. But you have all these doubled letters right there. That's a natural phenomenon from the Hebrew. Whenever you would put like the definite article or add a prefix or a suffix or do something to extend the word, it doubles that middle consonant it, as it as the closing of the first syllable and the beginning of the next. So that's a phenomenon we still see in English all the time. I just wanted to point that out when I saw it right there. So anyways, this word right here, the rib, and you when you look at it, it actually is not just a rib, but it also means the side. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because it's important. It's actually true. And it's consistent with what you will read directly after, just like you get a foreshadow and then the thing, right? 
you get the word itself and then you get the full meaning of what it is he explains it but right here you can see it says boards riverside there, there's a difference between a rib and a side but a rib can also be something else chambers hillside leaves like the edge of a leaf is the rib or the side right the side chamber like the temple ribs it calls them were the side chambers that were in it and then when you come down here you get the full gist of what that means right enclosing the temple like ribs the side chambers or cells or how they have that translated okay the ribs of a cedar or fig like the planks or boards and that's also for the temple wall or like the ark the leaves of a door are like the ribs and if you're familiar with the um oh, what is that chapter six or no 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 if you're familiar with chapter nine of the book of revelation there from the anti mishiach for dummies videos the word in the um the greek i can't remember what it is but they they translate it as breastplate in reality it was the uh the latin word would be ly uh, lyroca lyroca segmentata and lyroca is like the thorax in german or not german greek the english word thorax or uh the, the thorax in greek is where you get that ribbed or cages like the thorax would be the rib cage or the um the segmented body plates over a locust it's also the the segmented plates of a throat or this what goes over the chest of them and that uh the segmentata the low rica segmentata right there would be the the ribs or the segmented breastplate that was known for the known throughout the roman empire after they made them it was made out of the iron it was they even do um whenever they make videos because that was so well known as a as a roman thing that particular armor even when they're making movies or documentaries about times before it was invented they'll use that armor for for the romans even though it wasn't didn't even exist at the time it didn't come around until the byzantine army and the rise of constantine as part of the first woe of revelation <clears throat> which is the fifth trumpet but getting back on point here i just wanted to show you it wasn't just the rib but it was literally they he took the rib and the side part of the side out of adam and then formed that into the woman and that is exactly what you can read in just a moment here because it actually says uh, he actually calls it out right here so we'll just read that and he says so Yahuwah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And this would have been at the end of that second week before he had his wife. If you remember, Shaul says, I am speak a secret. I'm speaking of Mashiach and the assembly, but you husbands too be this way towards your wives, right? This is the parable here. He was slept, and then his wife was formed from him. Okay, and he's coming back as the bridegroom for the bride. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place, and the rib which Yahuwah Elohim had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh so you see it's not just the rib but it's also flesh so it's literally the rib and the side okay and that's the point the truth is true in every context you can't pick and choose what it means you literally just go by what's written ob willing we'll see that more and more this one is called woman because she was taken out of man for this cause the man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh and they were both naked the man and his wife yet they were not ashamed 
Now, Ab willing, you can start seeing the picture of him coming as the bridegroom and dying to ratify the covenant because he divorced Yisrael originally. And in the original Torah, the added bonds, he made divorce permissible because of the hardness of their hearts at that time. He himself made a certificate of divorce and sent Yisrael away, but then he came and died so that he can remarry her, including opening up deliverance for all the nations. <clears throat> all right, so chapter three. Is there any comments or questions that you have before we continue real quick, or do you have that? I'll go ahead and pause. All right, and then one more thing before we continue here. <clears throat> Excuse me. The word for a woman, right? And he called her woman, right? It says, la zot, that zot, right? The Zion Aleph Tau, or the Aleph Tau that a weapon is put to, means this, right? I, that's a very interesting word in itself, but that's not the point. But, and he called this one woman, or isha, ish. You have that doubling, and then there's different things that they have for all these vowels, right? The two dots right here are the accent mark. That's just where you put the emphasis when you say the word. The dot right here shows that it is uh, an SH sound, right? Isha and not the um, S sound. When you have the dot on the other side, it's the S, I believe. And then the dot right there in the middle is, again, the doubling dogish, where you have the S, and then the S closes that, and then begins the new one. So, Isha is a word for woman. Ish, Aleph, Yod, Sheen, is the word for man. And the in interesting thing here is when you have a man and woman together, it, the, you have the yod and the hay, which represents yaw. So when they're in unity, yaw is there. But if you remove him, if you take out the yod and the hay, then you have double ash, right? And that word right there, aleph sheen, is the word for fire. There's a gentleman. Oh, I believe he's a doctor. He wrote a couple books about the Paleo Hebrew letters and the Aleph Bet. He also has a video that I really appreciate about the Chayil Ishat or the virtuous woman. Uh, I can't remember his name. I'll have to find it. But he talks about that in detail where he goes with man and woman and what that represents in the Hebrew. You can see these things and that some people even teach on them. It doesn't take, you don't have to be a scholar. I didn't even finish high school. I got my GED and I went and I joined the army, but uh, it wasn't because of being unintelligent. There was other issues. The only point is you don't have to have a high school education. You don't have to have a college degree to learn how to read a language, to learn to study history, to learn what is true in any topic whatsoever. You can do it from your home. And anyone can. All you have to do is believe, ask the truth. He endows us with comprehension, right? But back on point. The Ish is a man with the working hand of the creator. Isha is the woman who makes evident or reveals the things of the creator. And together, when they're in perfect unity, he's, he's present, Right. And you can see these things also mentioned by Malachi when he's talking about the wife of your youth and the remnants of your, your Ruach are, are in her. Right. So those are parallels there. Also, as a help me, and I'll give you an example for myself because I can't speak for anyone else. <clears throat> it came about, I was listening to something and someone had mentioned that they were talking to a gentleman about, he was, he was a businessman. And he kept, his his wife was not, but he talked to her about things and he'd hear her opinion about stuff and he would just blow her off and just do things, but he was never successful. And then someone had suggested to him that maybe he should listen to his wife, 
that while she might not be as educated in the stock market or whatever it was he was doing, her insight could be for his benefit. And then when he took her the advice and he listened to his wife and started doing the things where he he pushed ideas back and forth off her and she'd tell her, well, well, that one sounds good, that one doesn't. And he just went with it. Boom, he started being successful and all that stuff. And it wasn't because she was educated. It wasn't because she was knowledgeable in the, the thing that he was doing. It was because she had the remnants of his Ruach. It, it was his our creator's will to manifest in that manner because the earth belongs to Yahuwah and all that fills it. And this is inherent in the very language. So while a, a woman is the helpmeet for the man and helps to make things evident to him, the man does the work, right? He's the leader. He's the one that you're supposed to emulate and follow as the example, like our Mashiach. And that's also inherent in the words there too. Ish is like the one doing it. Uh, you can think of like a man on a motorcycle, <laughs> the Aleph Shin Yod, right? And then the Isha is like the, the one that's passionate about revelation or making known. Maybe not inherent in themselves, but again, as, as that example. All right, so we're on chapter three real quick. We'll probably be able to get through this one. Maybe. And it says, and Nechash, <clears throat> which is the serpent. We'll go ahead and look at that real quick because that's another interesting word. You have Nechash, right? Again, the, the wa means and, or they, they translate that as now, but that's not the word for now. It's a conjunction. And, but, even so, if only, it's it's conjunction of thought. They most often translate it as and, right? Then he is the nachash. Nachash right here is serpent, they call it. And it literally is a serpent, right? Serpents, serpents, serpent, snake one time. So pretty unequivocal what that's supposed to be. However, you, you even find now that some people will make issue of what that actually represents. You find another witness of it because Moshe put the, the serpent, the Nechash on the bronze, right? The bronze serpent on the pole when the children were being bitten and poisoned in the wilderness and everyone who would look to it would be delivered. All right. Um, actually, perhaps we'll call that good for today. I'll get more info in just a moment, but yeah, we'll, we'll get onto that. So uh, it's getting late here. Um, we've got friends that are on the East Coast and everywhere too. So I'll, I'll see what they want to do. And we will continue with chapter three when we, get, when we get on this next week. You all have a wonderful Shabbat and we will see you next time.